Hello and uh, welcome back to another episode of IntentWise Connect. I'm uh, Srinath Reddy, uh, one of the founders here at IntentWise. Today, I have the pleasure of having Chad Rubin. Chad, thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me. A little bit of background on Chad. Uh, he, uh, at the moment, is the founder of Prophecy. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, it's, it's a company around dynamic pricing. He also runs a business of his own on Amazon called Think Crucial. And prior to that, he co-founded Scubana. And then he also was on the founding team of Prosper Show, which I think many of us know who are in the Amazon space. So you've, you know, so Chad, uh, you know, you've had a, a quite an entrepreneurial run. And we are going to talk about uh, dynamic pricing. But before we do that, do you want to share a little bit about your, uh, you know, about your journey so far up to Prophecy? Uh, sure. I mean, it's quite been quite a journey. I've been in e-commerce now for since 2006 or seven, roughly. So it's it's been a very long ride. Right? If you think about the change from 2006 or seven to 2022, uh, it's experienced significant change, and I feel like I've been very much so a part of that change and a catalyst for change in this industry. And so just identifying problems in the space. And early on, it was identifying the fact that there was no one making vacuum filters or coffee filters and selling them direct to consumer on Amazon. And then I came up with the idea that nobody actually was creating a enterprise-grade, purpose-built, modern-day version of NetSuite on the cloud. And that was Scubana. And then we identified that there was no community on Amazon, which now there is community, which is beautiful. And so um, all of this has really led me to prophecy, which is around solving more problems. And for me, I'm, I've been focusing on, especially, especially since like now, it's, there's been the shift in the Amazon, I think in e-commerce in general, a shift of growth at all costs to growing profitably and sustainably. And so um, in my own e-commerce business, I struggled with that specifically during this time frame, And this was born out of that problem. Great background. Um, let's dig into that a little bit. You talked about struggles, especially over the last couple of years, and perhaps that's a setup you know, into why dynamic pricing is so important at the moment. Talk to me about those struggles and just walk us through what, what those were and, you know, and how are you thinking about addressing them now? Yeah, so I think from a data perspective, things have been on the decline slowly. Um, so revenue, profit consistently declining, yet my ad spend being flat is an example. Cutting expenses and trying to get rid of redundant expenses, yet you know, operating margins still shrinking. Uh, failing to drive and convert listings appropriately. I mean, in the past couple months, inflation has been just massive. I mean, I think during COVID you had freight containers yeah. backed up and, and that inflation, but you have PPC inflation, you have raw material inflation, things are just getting too darn expensive. So you have that that's happening. By the way, this is not secular to me. This is, I think, across the board. Across the it's board. been stormy for D2C and Amazon uh, in the past year, let's say. And so I started asking questions, why, right? Like, well, how or how can I fix this, right? So how did we come up with our price? Did we pick out of the thin air? Or are we just going doing a little little guesswork? Maybe copying our competitors' price. Uh, our saturation in our category is at its peak. So how do you win if you're doing what every, everyone else is doing? And I tried everything, but actually one of the things I wasn't trying was price, which is a massive driver to EBITDA. Sure. So. That's that's sort of like how I started to come up with pricing to unlock profit growth at, at my e-commerce business. Fantastic. And, and you you frame this as dynamic pricing for the benefit of the audience. Can you actually describe what that means? Uh, what, what does it actually mean in the context of Amazon? Yeah, so just, so I think there's a lot of, let me just like, there's a lot of onions to peel back here. So one is repricing on Amazon uh, has existed for a very long time. Uh, that repricing is around winning the buy box. So a lot of a lot of these softwares haven't evolved into private label repricing. 
they're focusing on helping people win the buy box. And typically that means having the lowest price. But then in the past, say seven years, right? Amazon private label brands have been created. And every, you know, let's just say you type in the word garlic press, all these garlic presses show up. So then the question is, well, like, are you pricing optimally? And are you aligning your product to value? And are, is there a way to actually align your product to value at different times of the day to price perfectly? And in our situation of prophecy, we're trying to figure out how do you maximize profit without sacrificing BSR? So in many cases, brands are overpriced and maybe by lowering price, you can increase unit volume, which will offset uh, the lower of price. And in some cases, a lot of brands are actually underpriced, but in no situation have we discovered that brands are absolutely nailing price. And then you dig deeper and you're like, well, should pricing be static? If you're working in a fast moving marketplace like Amazon where things are changing and the shelf life of a product, the shelf life of your PPC spend is changing dynamically and constantly, how can you possibly just leave your price as is? And if you think about big players that are doing this right now, Amazon, first of all, Amazon in general, they change their price two and a half million times a day. Hmm. Uh, but you look at Uber has something called surge pricing. Expedia has uh, just, I mean, they just have, they just have dynamic pricing. So all these other big tech companies, massive power players are using dynamic pricing to optimize every penny of profit, yet Amazon brands aren't doing that at all. They're just leaving it constant. And so there's an arbitrage opportunity to maximize. Got it. By the way, Chad, this is uh, a lot of education for me as well, because I live in the advertising optimization and the data universe and not necessarily pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the point you brought up, which was super interesting, was historic repricers have focused on buying buy box. But the way you frame dynamic pricing is to uh, you know, maximize value at different points in time, given the constraints at that moment. Is that is that is that a right category? Exactly. I yeah. Know. Yeah. For sure. And by the way, le we live and die by the search engine ranking page, the SERP on Amazon. Yeah. We don't help sellers win and compete for the buy box. So we're built specifically for the private label community. Got it. And I have to. So in in our business at Intendwise, we are serving agencies and sellers and one P vendors. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, I, I think I know the answer, but I'm curious: is there an uh, is there an applicability of this for people on the one P side as well? Although they don't control price, right? Amazon does. So just curious how that plays into this. Yeah. So if you're one P, you're stuck because Amazon controls your price. They control your listing. They control everything. Yeah. And so we are built specifically for the three P marketplace side of things. Got you. And what makes this problem hard, Chad? Like, well, what, why can't anybody do it? Like, what, what, what makes this difficult? Uh, I would say it is a couple of things. One is, it's, first of all, it's hard to build a SaaS company in general. Not true. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's double hard, or maybe three X is hard, or exponentially is hard, actually, to build a AI first data science SaaS business. Why can't everyone do it? It's extremely capital intensive. Yeah. The only people that are doing this specifically the way that I'm doing it is uh is really the aggregators. This community has realized that in order to generate more EBITDA and to make the right decisions given the scale of their of the company and given the amount of data that they have, they need to deploy data science and algorithms to maximize their potential. So that's one piece of it is that, and I'd say like the other thing that makes it very hard is that there's so much data that a brand today has from Amazon specifically. And there's an art of capturing this data and being able to design the right algorithm to optimize and execute on the outcome that you want to achieve. And just while we're speaking about it, if I was just to share with the audience 
what it because there's a lot of BS, I would say, in our space around AI. And I'm sure you've seen this in the PPC space. Everyone just throws this word around. Yep. And it, it actually started has started to mean not quite much because it's logic that's been masquerading as AI. So I divide the world into artificial intelligence and authentic intelligence. And so we think about what I'm working on is I actually do have a true data science team. And to give you an idea, so Facebook, if you just joined Facebook today, you get an empty account and me and you are friends. Great. Okay. Facebook now knows that we're friends. Okay. That's interesting. But the way that Amazon or the way that Facebook picks up on clues is that they know what I spend time on. What do I dwell on? What do I touch? What do I like? What do I poke? Yeah. Um, what's my dwell time? And then they optimize so that I can essentially, uh, they, they give me more dopamine so I stay on the platform longer. And this is the way I explain it to my mother. So it's the same thing for us. Like there's not somebody in Facebook that's literally sitting behind the screen and telling you if this, then this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to show you this video, then I'm going to connect you with this friend. Yeah. It's all happening behind the scenes. Yep. And that is the way that an algorithm should work on Amazon specifically, pulling in this data, creating its own if then else statements in the back end to optimize for the outcome that you want to achieve. In this case, we're programmatically inputting, uh, we want to optimize for profit without sacrificing your bestseller rank, your competitive positioning on Amazon. Got you. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the noise around AI, um, the point you made is not lost on me. I mean, we lived through it. Uh, there isn't a software pitch that does not have AI in it. Um, and, you know, and there's no way to verify. So a lot of rules-based logic gets framed as AI. And, and uh, for what it's worth, uh, there's a lot of confusion around it. Now, um, and, and, I, and just by the way, just to, to, to double click into your point about verification, right? You can look at businesses, LinkedIn profiles that are pitching AI and go and see the people that are working there. And if you see that there's no data scientists on staff and you see that yeah. there's no machine learning engineers on staff, that tells you exactly what you need to know. Yeah, agree. Um, now talking about machine learning algorithms, um, Obviously, there's algorithms and there's inputs. Uh, quality of inputs have a dramatic impact on the quality of outputs. Mm -hmm. I know you probably can't share too much, but I am curious about what inputs are going into this dynamic pricing algorithm, just broadly speaking. Um, and if you could give some sense of uh, just what inputs and perhaps frequency as well, that'd be interesting. Yeah. So you have your macro inputs that we pull in in the model, right? Your seasonality, mm -hmm. your holidays, uh, even factoring in inflation, interest rates on a macro level. But yeah. then you start getting really deeper into the variables that are available to you, by the way, from Seller Central, from the advertising API, along with from third-party applications that are giving you data. And so then you can start getting really deep into Amazon listing characteristics, reviews, the quality of the reviews, the quantity of the reviews, your own price, your inventory position, your competitor's price. Uh, that's just the beginning, right? The tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And so pricing isn't just a factor of one of those. It's a factor of many of those things. And there's so, like I said, there's so much data yeah. That a human can take advantage of that. And the only way that you can, well, I mean, if you have one skew, maybe you can, but it's like over analysis paralysis. And then you have to, the kind of crunching you need to do on a daily basis to figure that out, you might as well just deploy AI anyway. Yeah. And so that's from a data perspective. And, and the reason why this hasn't been, this hasn't happened, I would say is twofold is one is like, there's a lot of BS in our space around it. And um, the second is that data science is still relatively nascent. I actually still think that we're in the early stages of AI being deployed, even though the big companies in the SaaS world have acquired this technology, it hasn't necessarily been democratized across all SaaS, all of SaaS yet. Fair enough. Uh, the, um, in terms of, uh, you talked about PPC a few times. What's the direct tie-in to PPC optimization. Uh, are you seeing things where, you know, um, 
pricing is actually a lever in advertising optimization. Uh, and can you just walk through what you're seeing or what you expect to see around that? Because I think PPC, to your point, PPC inflation is real. You mm. know, I keep saying the honeymoon in PPC is over. <laughs> Mm. And you're going to have to eke out your optimizations. And it isn't just PPC, it's inflation, it's it's costs of all kinds, so on and so forth. But I am curious, uh, how do you tie PPC with dynamic pricing? Yeah, so, but we're not a PPC tool and we have no intention of, of becoming a PPC tool. There's yeah. many and plenty of tools out there. In fact, we use at my e-commerce business, we use IntentWise. Well, thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the thing with pricing, and again, it's a beautiful, very hard challenge to solve, yeah. is that if you, if you think about the way that Amazon sellers are looking at their, how do they evaluate whether they're successful in advertising? They're looking at the efficiency of their ad spend. The way that they look at efficiency of ad spend is that they're looking at their A costs or typically sometimes their tacos. And so if you think about A cost, A cost is a percentage of what you spend to a percentage of what you make, right? Yeah. And most people are focusing on this part of the equation, what they spend, and they're adjusting that and figuring out. And by the way, there, a lot of people are honing in, as you know, on their campaigns and their isolating campaigns. Everyone has their own strategy. Yep. But yet this part of the equation, which is this is what you spend and this is what you make. Nobody's touching this side of the equation. And so we're focusing on this side of the equation, which is what you're making and optimizing for what you're making and adjusting that. And right now, like there is no communication between our platform and for example, telling you to maybe increase spend or low, lower spend, but like that is an opportunity for people to go back into their application and to increase or decrease spend. Yeah. And in a weird way, the fastest way to improve A costs perhaps is to be able to raise price if, if the market can take it, right? And your top line uh, stays the same. That'll be the fastest way to improve A costs <laughs> or tacos. <laughs> totally. But I also want to say, like, if you think about Amazon, the reason why it even gets more complicated. Sure. So you hear a lot of like gurus in the Amazon space saying, hey, just raise prices. And so talking about pricing is like very easy. Yeah. It's it's essentially not so easy because the price you, you, if you change your price today, it has an effect on tomorrow's orders because it has effect not only on your, on your ACOS, like you mentioned, but it also has effect on your BSR rank and the, the flywheel on Amazon. And I hate to use the flywheel as an example, but it is absolutely so true. And so like if Amazon's a living, breathing entity, uh, it's a living, breathing market marketplace, just like the stock market, um, it becomes that much more challenging to just statically put a price into the universe and just leave it there for forever. Well, it turns out Chad and I are big fans of uh, Bollywood songs, so we just decided to change up our shirts and locations like it happens in those songs. What do you say, Chad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, actually, what happened was we had a technical snafu, so we decided to record from where we left off, so here we are. Uh, Chad, are you good to go? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I actually do like Bollywood music. <laughs> and I think uh, what's his name, Raman, just just performed here in Hollywood, Florida. Where he's oh yeah. yeah, 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 Raman, yeah, um, huge fan. Um, yeah, just to pick up where we left off on the dynamic pricing topic, Prime Day is coming up, and of course Walmart followed suit as well, and they've got a big event uh, coming up next week. A couple of couple of questions. One is. What are your thoughts on why Amazon could be doing this? And two, how does dynamic pricing play out in the context of big uh, event or shopping uh, days like this? Yeah, so I think pricing in general, uh, I'm gonna answer the latter question first. So I think, I think pricing in general is very important, especially to notice the right signals during a big shopping day like this. And you have to notice them too late. And a lot of times during Prime Day, like, I mean, yes, you could spend time hourly looking at every SKU, but if you actually are pricing 
to value and pricing to demand based on when people are coming to your listing, it would make a lot more sense to have a dynamic repricer. Now, for those that are running like pr prime deals using Prophecy, they'll let us know, they know in advance whether they're going to run a prime deal because uh, like there has to be the lowest price at a specific time frame for a specific time on Amazon. So we're working with clients directly uh, to make sure that their lowest price is the floor in our dynamic repricer. But outside of that, right, if pricing is all about signals and you're trying to monetize value for your clients, it doesn't make sense, it's sense to have a static price, especially when demand and conversions and impressions are changing. And, and do, you have, do you have an input mechanism on what's happening to competitive pricing at the same time uh, on days? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. So we pull in competitive pricing based on a reverse ASIN lookup. And so we'll, everything's driven in prophecy based on the keywords that you're ranking for. Got you. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and I think that we're just in the early beginning beginning of AI in general, but also dynamic pricing for prophecy, right? Like there's so many more variables and so many more inputs you putting in and layering into the model. It's it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and then just to your first question around Amazon and Prime Day, like I, I mean, back in the day, I used to cover Amazon as a stock on Wall Street and give advice to hedge funds and institutional investors to buy, sell, or short stocks. And Amazon, especially during the Great Recession of 2009, was an incredible place to park your money as an investor. It was, I would say, near recession-proof. And I think there's a mentality right now, like Amazon is the cheapest, Amazon has the best service, like you can't go wrong, which is why you see a lot of D2C brands embracing Amazon. But again, back to your point again, I think what I'm trying to share is that this is sort of, I think, in a way, Amazon's way of gaining more and more market share. So having the second prime day, even before Black Friday, Cyber Monday, is like pretty incredible that they're doing this. And um, they're just gonna need more and more market share through this process, especially as we're in a recession, you know, as we're in a recession and getting deeper into a recession. And how much of this do you think is driven, uh, Chad, by the inventory levels everywhere? Is, is that, you think, a driver? And also, I mean, you've seen a lot of these uh, shopping seasons uh, you know, in different capacities yourself. Um, what are you foreseeing? Yeah, so there's no question, I think, that a lot of brands overstocked. I think Amazon's warehouses, like they're not in business to store your stuff, they're in your in business to sell your stuff. So there is, I think, a sense of that. But I think the other piece of it is Amazon has to still provide shareholder value. And the way that they do that is by maximizing profit. And so this is a profit-driven event for Amazon now. Many sellers are not profitable during Prime Day, but this definitely is profitable for Amazon. I mean, Amazon's marketplace is the second biggest, or maybe it was the second biggest, maybe it's the third. So it was AWS driving the most amount of profit. And then it was Amazon's marketplace. That's right. And then now it's advertising. So you think you have advertising number one, AWS number two, and the marketplace number three, but this is a drive for profit, especially in, in a time where it's, it's very stormy for many B2C and e-commerce brands. Yeah, and I think it's such a different environment uh, compared to the previous year. Uh, and everyone's, I think a lot of companies have planned looking at comps from last year and it's just a very different environment now. So I'm certainly curious what even our existing clients will experience as we go through the next three months. So, do, And do you, do you think that you're going to shop on the second Prime Day? Like, are you going to like open up Amazon and kind of check out the deals? I've got parents visiting from India and they want to buy a bunch of stuff before they leave. So I, yeah, there's a list. There is a list. So, I got, yeah. uh, so I've got to deliver on that promise. So yeah, a, a Kindle and uh, yeah, a few other things, but yes, uh, I think we'll, we'll, I'll do, I'll do a little bit of that. Nice. And I think for me, when I was doing the first prime day this year, when I stocked my cart and I got it prepared, so I thought that the new prices would be reflective. I think there was there was something that was happening around pricing where it wasn't reflecting in my cart the new price and I had to re-add these products to my cart. Like I built a whole cart of all the things I wanted because I was going to manage price that way. Yeah. And be like, oh, this price went down eight dollars. This price went down seven dollars. This price went up four dollars. Whatever. And um, anyway, so I do have a list of things I'm looking I'm looking at, and um, 
you know, I think Amazon's doing 60% of e-commerce transactions right now, roughly. And uh, you and me are both going to go to amazon.com and see what else we can buy at a cheap price. We buy low, sell high. Totally. By the way, do you guys support Walmart too? Just Amazon right now. And, and the reason why we chose Amazon was that I think it's very customary as per this conversation for prices to change on Amazon. Like we as consumers are very used to pricing changing. But if you went to Allbirds or if you went to, I don't know, that guitar that's in your background there, is that a Zoom background or? Uh, no, 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 it's, 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 it's real. Oh, cool. Is it, is it a ukulele or? <laughs> it is it actually, you can, it's, a, it's a ukulele. I think it, the size <laughs> is a little confusing. Like it's, it's actually yeah. not that big. It's a ukulele. Yeah. It's funny, the perception of that is totally. interesting in the camera. Everyone, everyone thinks it's a guitar, but it's not. So it's huh. it four strings if you notice, and it's just it's funny. funny. <laughs> no. um, so I was saying um, price changing is customary on Amazon. Like even in that guitar, hmm. like if, if you bought it from the guitar store, you might be like, oh wait, I bought it for 180 bucks and now it's a hundred bucks. Like, shoot, yeah. I don't, that's horrible experience. But on Amazon, in this, it's a fast trading marketplace. People just are, very aware that price changes all the time and are okay with it. Makes sense. What do you not do with dynamic pricing? I know you've been doing this for a bit. Like, what do you not do? <laughs> uh, and what do you, what do you, what, what should you be careful about? Um, <clears throat> what do we not do? Uh, well, I think that there's always more variables to pull in. And I guess if, you know, if I'm sharing this with like a community of people that are listening and are interested and perhaps you know, maybe they want to know more about prophecy, but maybe they don't, right? And so maybe you actually just, what I'm trying to get across to people is that maybe you just start looking at your pricing yourself and having your own analysis. I think that's probably the best thing I can share is starting to quantify on a spreadsheet and analyze your pricing and seeing if you're leaving money on the table. I know it can be a long and drawn out exercise, but take one SKU, look at your best selling SKU or your, your the SKU that's driving you the most revenue and start analyzing in a source of truth document, your pricing to see if small tweaks can actually garner more profit dollars for your business. And then trying to see how that connects with ACOS, right? And maybe you deploy more dollars into that campaign or maybe you start shuffling that money into other areas and then start scheduling maybe a regular cadence with your team around pricing reviews. Yeah. To integrate pricing as a dedicated topic in your, I don't know if you're running, if people are listening or running level 10 meetings, but pricing should be front and center of your conversations and, and, and really build a strength around it. Fast forward just a little bit of time, Chad, and let's assume that every competitor is doing some kind of dynamic pricing. How does that play out? Like, and, and when you think about your algorithms, like uh, how are you trying to model for that? And it's a bit of a complex situation, especially in categories where there is tons and tons of long tail competition. How do you think about that problem? Well, so A, we have no competitors. So that's really good. And um, two, I think what gets interesting for me as we get more market share in the space that I think I prefer to think about is what if you have two companies that are on page one that we manage price for that sell this lighter? I think that's where things get interesting. And I actually haven't, we haven't gotten there yet because yeah. we're so early and we're so new. Um, but I think that's when things certainly get interesting when you have two like products in the same category of the same keywords using processing. But our goal, of course, for both of those companies is to maximize profit. Yeah. So what is the decision when you have two competitors? And this is a great question. I don't have the answer, right? And yeah, yeah, fair enough. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it, it is a complex uh, situation. Like to your point, could be the same product, could be the same price. Cost structures could be fundamentally different between two companies. How does all that play out if the goal is profit maximizing? So yeah, totally. so, <laughs> uh, yeah, fun, complex problem. Um, one of the questions I ask my 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 guests, uh, uh, Chad, is just if you were to have, if you were to leave the audience with one piece of advice, what would that be? 
Well, I shared some advice around having like a pricing committee and developing a discipline around pricing. Um, hmm. Good question. I would say in general, specifically, that we need to have a competitive advantage. Hmm. And in a market like Amazon, where the barriers to entry are really low right now, um, you need to be smart about what you're selling and think about the stage your product life cycle is in and think about the business that you're in specifically and the business you want to become and focus on what you want to become versus staying stagnant with where you're at. Yeah. I think the point about value prop is so spot on. And I think it, 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 it has to be something that has to be pervasive in the sense that whether you're thinking PPC management, pricing, content, whatever. Uh, the point about value prop is so critical um, because none of that actually works with if the product doesn't have a compelling value prop. And then it mm. does become a price game and that's all it is. And it's just that's just tough. Um, so great point. Chad, uh, I think this is a topic that I personally had not thought much about. Um, Pricing is always important, building any business, but in a dynamic environment like Amazon's, dynamic pricing makes a whole lot of sense. Thank you for taking the time, just walking us through that complexity. And frankly, I love the complexity of the problem you're solving. <laughs> it's cool. Thank you for appreciate. Thank you for appreciating it. It's, it's a tough one. <laughs> yes, and um, and then the more data you ingest, and you know, the more fun it becomes. Um, so I love that. Again, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, this has been super educational and uh, we will be in touch. Yeah, thank you for having me. And if, if you want to uh, chat with me, you can feel free to email me, chat at Prophecy or go to my LinkedIn. I'm always sharing tidbits of information there or Twitter. So I'm open to connecting and helping others and supporting the community. Fantastic. And I think you've, you've, you've been doing quite a bit in the space for quite some time. So I'm glad I had a chance to actually host you and chat. So thank you I'll so see much. You. I'll see you at the next event. Yes, sir. Take care.